our next speaker uh, uh, is a you know a, a brother of a different mother and father. Uh, dear, dear, dear friend, going back to the 1960s uh, when I was chairman of the Michigan Conservative Union back in '75 to uh, '81. He was the second uh, vice president. He became the third chairman of uh, the Michigan Conservative Union. Most importantly, he has trained more than 50 college professors around the country in Austrian economics, one of the top uh, stars in, in the economic world, the Austrian school, Dr. Harry C. Reisman. Convention. Uh, number one is uh, the French Revolution started with one of these things. And uh, there's two times in history that it did not have good results. Uh, one was the, the calling of the Estates General by uh, King Louis XVI, which led to that horrible uh, situation with the French Revolution. And the other one is in the Catholic Church with Vatican II. So I would, I would uh, urge you. Uh, to, to uh, try to stop any kind of constitutional convention. I think after what I'm going to say tonight, or this afternoon, uh, you'll see what we really don't need a uh, balanced budget amendment. Okay, so I've been having to setting the chessboard. Uh, the economic challenges during the presidency of uh, Donald J. Trump. Next slide, please. As I see it, that, uh, what we only have is so great. Okay. Okay. The challenges for the administration are really three or four. Uh, although there are a lot more, but I don't want to keep you here all day uh, going through the economics. So um, I just picked out about four that are uh, that are important. Okay. Uh, the first one is the increase in interest rates and entitlements. Uh, number two is China and Russia the One World Belt Initiative, uh, which is very close to the gold back loop that we want, and then um, the concept of regulation. Now, if you just take a look at it, the federal revenues, one of the major problems of approaching this is we have $21 trillion of debt. If the interest rates, and the interest rates are going up, if you notice that, and they're going to have to go up. And the reason is, is because of the fact that the dollar has fallen about 19% in the last year. Now, my students asked me, they said, well, why does it mean that the dollars fall 19%? I said, take a look at your, uh, when you get put your gas tank up. Because as the dollar falls, the price of gas will go up because of the fact that it tightens up the dollar on our world energy markets. So what we're looking at is challenges for the administration because of the fact that that Congress does not seem to be able to control itself at this point. Although I think the control is coming, it's not coming from um, internally, but we are going to have external discipline. Uh, in fact, as China and Russia move towards the gold standard, that is going to have a serious effect, and probably for conservatives, a rather good one, because it will force the United States to enter into a um, relationship with the gold currency, which means there will no longer be any more printing of money to cover budget deficits. And that is, um, it, it's interesting, most people are, are angry at the Chinese and the Russians, but I think that the progressive movement may have died on, on uh, the 23rd of March when China issued uh, the gold back one. Okay? Um, but the problem is, by 2032, the way things are going, the challenge is this is what the federal receipts are. Uh, it gives you an idea of where the money comes from. And remember, as Edmund Burke said, a government is its revenues. And repeat that. A government is its revenues. And the question is, is where is this revenue going to go? Okay? Right now, at the projected rate, all revenue will go towards health care, social security, and net interest. 
by the year 2032. That's at the present projection. That means there'll be no money for defense, no money for the federal courts, no money for anything else but those things. And, of course, it's a trend that Mr. Trump is going to have to, to, to deal with because um, as, the, as two things are going to happen in the future, as entitlements grow and as they lose control of the interest rates, which they're doing now as it begins to rise. Because remember, if you have a $20 trillion, okay, at 2.5%, you know, you're talking about $400 million, billion dollars a year in interest payments. Okay? I mean, that's a significant not amount of interest payments that have to be paid. And I think it's one of the reasons that these folks are hoping that a con con can put the brakes on it. It's not going to put the brakes on it. Okay? The only thing that's going to put the brakes on it is a, is, a, um, is a currency that they can't control. If we take a look at federal income taxes, we take a look at that, uh, only, only about 50% of the American people are paying income tax at this point. Um, the others pay it through, through buying products and they're paying the corporate tax. Because remember, the corporate tax is paid for by consumers. When they tell you they're taxing General Motors or they're taxing IBM or whatever else, you can't tax the corporation. The corporation simply shifts the, the forward to the consumers or shifts it backward um, to labor or whatever else, but it's you can pay the tax. So you can take a look at the percentage of corporate taxes as a percentage of federal revenue. Now, the one thing I want to really talk about that no, nobody is really talking about right now is the One Belt, One Room initiative. Okay? And I think we are making a terrible mistake because we are relying on military assets. China is rely and Russia, but China especially, is relying on commercial activity. I've been to China. And they uh, continually talk about soft power. Every day I was there, they were signing trade agreements with another country. And so China now is doing what? Is using soft or economic power uh, rather than military power. And China is building trade relationships throughout the Mideast, Africa. Um, friends of mine are consultants to the company. The Chinese are all over Africa signing what? commercial agreements. We have not been doing that. Okay? We've been relying too much on military power. And we have we have neglected. We have neglected the commercial side. And let me say this. The strength of America is the economy and the technological work we've done. It is not the military. The military is an after effect to the economy. Um, and so my urging of this administration and any other administration is to open up commercial relationships. But they're in South America. Uh, they just had a, a major conference in February in Budapest, in which China is signing up the Eastern, the Eastern European bloc and to connect that railroad. They are now sending a thousand trains a year from China to Europe uh, selling their products. And I don't see any effort on the United States to open up these commercial relationships. Now our, what we've been doing, and I'll show you the difference, this is our global reach of the U.S. military. So we've been building military bases around the world. You can see all the places that we have military bases, okay? And most Americans would say, oh, this is wonderful, uh, we have these military bases. Let me show you what the Chinese have done. This is, this is the Silk Road. The One Belt, One Road Initiative. They are they are connecting railways, and one of the things they're connecting to, and they won't go through, is through Syria. Okay, and you have to understand that the Chinese, if you take a look geographically, uh, we always look at the thing called geopolitics. If they connect the railroad to a level, and they, by the way, have signed the contracts to repair a level after the war. And I've seen what Chinese do, okay? You will not, and those of you who are younger will not recognize a level. It will be full of skyscrapers and hotels and business, okay? And they'll connect it to that port that the Russians control that will give them access by sea to the Mediterranean and to all of Europe. 
Okay, if you take a look at it, they're, they're reaching into the South Pacific. This is the, the, the blue is their, um, is their um, sea belt, and the red is the rail belt. And I've ridden on Chinese railroads, and believe me, it's like the difference between driving on German roads and driving on our roads, American roads in Cone County. Okay, the roads are smooth, they're fast. Uh, Chinese railroads are very, very efficient. Uh, notice that they're that they're going to go into the Persian Gulf, and I'll show you a couple of other things. They're already going into Afghanistan with rail. They've opened up a large copper mine. And you might say, is it bad for them to open up a copper mine? Absolutely not, because they're going to pour more copy out, copper out in the markets. Those increased copper on the markets are going to lower copper prices for us. So anytime you increase supply, you lower, you lower the prices across the board. Um, I think one of the reasons, and I'll get into why uh, Trump is, is, has these uh, fakey tariffs. He really doesn't mean to put these in, by the way. He's trying to negotiate with them. Okay, that's the thing you should understand. That's why the market went down, went back up, and it's very volatile. But notice, um, they are, they are uh, moved into South Asia, and if you take a look at it, the, another thing on the One Belt, One Road Initiative, this is the, um, this is the member states of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Notice England's a member, okay? South Korea is a member. Egypt, Saudi Arabia, India, they're all, this is the counterpoint to the IMF. Okay, so what they're doing is establishing this inter, inter infrastructure bank, and guess who will have the contracts to build the infrastructure from the Chinese bank? Chinese companies. Okay, um, they're in Africa. I have, I have a nephew who is in uh, Tanzania. And uh, the Chinese are in there building the railroad. And they told the Tanzanians, they said, uh, folks, here's the situation. We'll build the railroad, we'll maintain the railroad, and we'll run the railroad. And the Tanzanians said, why? They said, well, you let the German and uh, English railroads go to pot. You're not letting our railroad go to pot. Okay? The Chinese have this kind of part of their DNA of building railroads. Okay, so they see where they're going to build these railroads. But this is the important thing, that this is a major bank. This is a major bank, and it's having major effects throughout the world. And if you take a look at it, all of, all of them in brown are all the countries that are connected with this infrastructure bank. Okay? In addition, we have the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And this is kind of a counterpoise to NATO. And if you can see there, this is the Chinese president with the, um, I think the president of either Pakistan or India. And they're making, they're making uh, an arrangement. And this is how big this is. Okay? These are all the countries that are members in red by the uh, members. Uh, there are observers. And those are in green. Okay? Occasional attendees, Afghanistan, and observers. And by the way, one of the countries that's join them is Israel. Israel has joined up and is a, a member of this organization. So you're seeing um, the penetration um, and we say that there's uh, the cooperation in various areas. Um, the SCO, the Shanghai um, uh, Cooperation Organization, um, what they'll do is they'll handle security, economy, transportation, culture, Disaster relief and law enforcement, plus economic and uh, social cooperation. Okay. Also, they're going to uh, they will fight against terrorism. Uh, and notice that they're they're uh, and they will have joint anti-terrorist military exercises. So these countries are getting closer and closer together. Now, just to give you another example, of what's going on? And this is things that Trump and American presidents are going to have to deal with. Okay. Uh, if you take a look at it, that is the uh, track in the commercial corridor, uh, 4,600 miles of, of um, trade route from um, China into where? Into Afghanistan, where they're opening up mines, they're opening up commercial relationships. And I think their chances of pacifying Afghanistan are a lot better 
than by sending American troops. Okay? Um, and I uh, we would say in Pakistan, this is the other corner, um, they are coming in Pakistan, and if you notice, this will give them access to the Persian Gulf. They'll be right at the tip of the Persian Gulf, and in, um, uh, I think it's Kirkuk uh, at Karachi, uh, they're already building a naval base, as they are in uh, Glendar, which is more of a commercial base. Okay? The yuan and the ruble are set to compete with the dollar. The, our, our dollar is really backed by oil. And you say, well, why is it backed by oil? Because the agreement was that you could only buy oil with dollars, called the petrol dollar. That strengthened the American dollar, because in order to buy the oil, you had to get American dollars, and then you could buy the oil. Qatar and, um, has now accepted petrol, uh, petrol yuan as it opens up. The, the uh, Saudis will begin to accept petrol yuan, and that's going to put enormous pressure on the dollar. Okay? Notice there, there is a backed by gold, and um, ours is backed by oil. Now, if you take a look at global reserve currencies, okay, and it shows you the countries that have, um, that were the global currency. Uh, Portugal, for the first 80 years, was the global reserve currency. And then Spain, the Netherlands, France, uh, Great Britain, about 105 years, the British pound was the global reserve currency. And the United States, we took over after, um, after World War I, we are still the global reserve currency. But see, it's, what's happening is, is these currencies were backed by gold or silver. Ours is fiat, or backed by oil. So we have fiat money, it isn't really backed by anything. Okay? Oops. Put this back on paper. Put this here so it doesn't do that. Okay. Um, so it's not backed by anything. Okay, um, if you take a look at the reserve currencies today, the United States is the major reserve currency, although uh, the second one is the euro. China is not, doesn't appear yet. It doesn't appear yet, but the question is, is it soon will be um, into that uh, currency. Okay, um, now, if we take a look, this cartoon kind of shows it all. Uh, we have the United States with uh, fiat money, uh, China with gold, um, and um, they're tossing them back and forth, so they're saying, um, we'll, tr we'll trade you uh, gold for fiat and fiat for gold. Um, and the, the major thing, I think, in the next 10 years will be uh, the coming of the, of, the, um, of the reserve currency. China now is the biggest purchaser of oil. They exceed us. And this gives you an idea of where they get their oil from. Uh, notice they're buying oil all over the world, and they're going to go to these oil producers, and they're going to say, hey, fellas, we want to pay you in yuan. And they're going to say, well, what can you buy with yuan? You can buy all kinds of things from us with yuan. And we can, you can turn us your oil, and guess what? We'll build hotels for you, we'll build railroads for you, etc. In other words, we are trading the Saudis with military equipment. They're going to go in there and promise consumer goods and market goods. Now this is a um, very, very important uh, step. And um, remember, one of the problems with China has been, historically, is that the British wanted to buy all kinds of tea from China. But the British didn't produce anything the Chinese wanted. So what did they trade them? Opium. That led to the opium wars. And a tremendous problem. Okay? We now have, everybody now has stuff the Chinese want. Oil and natural resources. Now along that, that silk road are 80% of the world's resources in oil and in minerals. So it's a very, very important strategic step. Um, and one of the things, I think it's been a terrible mistake, I'm going to say some things that are probably are not going to ring well in your ears, but I think these Russian sanctions have been a terrible mistake, because it's just pushing Russia and China closer together, okay? Uh, from the economic standpoint, a little worse decisions. 
And, and uh, we're just doing it because of the Syria thing. And the, the, the Syria war is lost. I mean, China is moving in there. Okay? Um, now, just take a look at what's happened. Would you want this as your reserve currency? In 1913, it's a dollar. And today, it's worth four cents. Okay? And you can take a look at what's happened since the establishment of the Fed. Since the establishment of the Fed, the dollar's lost about 96% of its value. Well, if, if you're trading a currency that's losing that kind of value, and you're competing against the currency which is not losing any value because it's backed by gold, guess which way things are going to go? Okay? It's, it's going to go to what? The stronger currency. Okay? Um, this shows you uh, the dollar is now used only in 40% of the payments. Um, and, and global payments going back and forth. But with the Chinese currency coming on board, that is going to expand. Okay? Um, let me give you an example. What happens? And um, when we fought the Civil War, in order to finance the Civil War, the Union issued greenbacks, fiat money. Okay? But at the same time, there were circulating in the Union gold-backed banknotes. Well, what happened was, as, as the Union printed up more greenbacks, the value of the greenback fell against gold. So there was what we call the discount. Okay? And the more they printed, the worse it got. So what did they do? They outlawed gold. They taxed the state banknotes out of existence and closed down the gold market in order to maintain the currency, okay? Now, we're facing the same thing. The only thing is, is we cannot outlaw, and we cannot outlaw Russia and China going on a gold standard. They're too big to invade. There's no way you're, gonna, you're going to do that. So uh, uh, what happens is the greenback went down to about 46 cents. Now, saying this for the Union, in 1879, they finally did pay the greenbacks off with gold. So, I mean, one thing the United States did, it was one of the few times in history in which irredeemable paper money was paid off with gold. But the reason was is because we had an enormous economic growth. Okay? Now, if you take a look at it, what's happening here is why did we back the... Um, the dollar with oil, after Nixon and Johnson, the two of them, uh, broke the gold standard, okay? Well, increased oil demand, since you have to buy oil with dollars, would be increased dollars, and it gave the United States an edge. I mean, we had an edge for the last, uh, whatever number of years, almost 50 years now, that we broke that standard because of the oil back. And so um, the question is, is now, if you don't need to have dollars to buy oil, you're going to have um, you're going to have a um, a situation where the dollar is going to lose value, and it has been losing value on currency markets. Now, this is the benefits, and we had enormous benefits of the because we had artificial demand for dollars. And see what's happening, folks, is there's two forces working. One force is the production of goods and services. The other is the printing of money. What has saved us is that productivity here has kind of stepped up and technology has exploded. Okay, England was an enormous threat after the Napoleonic Wars. What saved England? The steam engine. Okay, it was the technology that saved Great Britain. Great Britain. It was the computer chip that saved the United States economy. But at this point now, China has computer chips and the rest of the world has computer chips. So we have to take another very serious look at it. Okay, here are two of my not so favorite people in history, Nixon and Johnson. So I don't have Johnson there, but I'll get to him. The party of the gold and silver backing, Kissinger creates the petrol dollar. The one thing you got to say about the, uh, the Henry, he is a brilliant manipulator. Okay, like him or not, he's a brilliant manipulator. And he dreamt this petrol dollar up. And it has kind of worked, okay? Um, if we take a look at the road to inflation, 
progressive Democrat, Lyndon Baines Johnson, signs the Coinage Act in 1965, removing the silver backing from the U.S. currency, reversing a law signed by George Washington in 19, 1792. The Washington signed that law, and the penalties for tampering with the currency were capital punishment. Okay, you couldn't, if you were contemplating the currency or debasing uh, it, you got taken care of. Okay, on June the 24th, um, Johnson signed the sunset provision uh, pending the convertibility of the dollar into silver. And on March 20th, Johnson signed the law suspending the gold backing for the U.S. dollar of 25%. Now, I tell my students, I say, I got an assignment for you. What is it? I said, I want you to go ask your parents and your grandparents how much student debt they had. You come back, well, professor, they didn't have any student debt. I said, that's right. I said, you know why we didn't have any student debt? Because we were on the gold and silver standard debt. We were able to work our way through college or uh, help. It wasn't that expensive. And those of you who are, who are uh, my age can remember when we had silver coins in our pocket and gasoline was two bits a gallon of silver. Okay? They suspended this. Why? To keep this monster alive that we have going where they think they can just print money to cover the deficits. And I think this is coming to an end. Okay? Um, the the uh, petrol dollar is really backed, is really backed by oil because it requires the oil to be purchased. That's ending. Okay? This will give you an example of what's happened with regards to um, uh, income growth. The blue is 90% of us. Okay? The red is the 1%, the wealthy. Now, leftists are complaining about the distortion in income. And they're right. Take a look when it happened. While we're on gold, up to 1971, the bottom was prospering. Okay, and then after it, they took us off, take a look at what happens. Immediately, the upper 1% are gaining. Now, if we have some time, I can explain you this called the Campion effect. When you print money, the first people who get the money have the advantage. That's the Campion effect. If I were to ask you, I'm going to turn a whole pile of money here. You want, did you give us, uh, how many of you want us first? Absolutely. Why? Because the prices haven't gone up yet. And what's happened is, and we can go into a long lecture on this, is that since we've been printing this money, where are the centers of wealth? They're not making things. They're in Washington and New York. Where these people are borrowing this money, going into the stock market, driving the things up. Where, and I, when I show this map to my students, I said, take a look at this map. I didn't put this in because I know I don't have a lot of time. And you probably don't want to sit a long time for a long economics lecture. But I said, um, Washington. I said, here's all this, the counties that have been getting all kind of money, and uh, where, uh, income is rising. And here's the ones down. I said, do you see any place on that makes anything? No. It's Washington, where there's miles and miles of, of uh, McMansions, and New York. It should be what? It should be Detroit. It should be places that make things, that do things. And this destruction has taken place. And in my studies, every single country, that's engaged in this inflation has lost their manufacturing base. Rome did, Spain did, Turkey did. The history is undeniable. And guess what? We engaged in it, and we lost it too. Okay? Now, take a look, because Trump's complaining about the trade balance. Now, folks, really, the trade balance is what they're lending us. Okay? Last year, we had a $100 billion trade balance with China. Where is that money? They lent it back to us. In other words, they're, they're giving us money, they're lending us money to buy their stuff. That's what that trade balance means. Take a look at when the trade balance went south. Um, we were, oops, uh, we were actually, uh, under this situation, Big enough. If you take a look, 19, 
I wish I had a pointer, but take a look. 1970, we were actually shipping more stuff out of this country than we were bringing in. Well, there's a point. The green Okay, folks, okay, take a look here. 1971, right? Our trade balance is positive under the gold standard. Take a look what's happened to the trade balance under fiat money. Okay? You can just see exactly what's happened. And Americans are going, and what it means is we're going further and further into debt. The explosion of debt since 1971 has been absolutely phenomenal. If I were uh, going to, uh, I, I, I said we don't need a constitutional amendment. We need a gold standard. Okay? We need to go back to that. And we can go back to it. I'll show you that. Okay, people who tried to do it, this is the petrodollar, which occurs the, the dollars. Now, a few countries later have challenged the petrodollar and stayed in power. I mean, remember, folks, in politics, there's two reasons. There's the good reason and the real reason. Okay? You've been told that the good reason to go into Iraq and Libya is because they were dictators and some other nonsense. The real reason was they were challenging the dollar, the petrodollar. And they aren't going to be able to do that with Russia and China. That's over. Okay? Um, and you take a look, this is what happened. Okay? And you trace the wars, right? Okay. Um, Hussein dropped the, the dollar in 2000. Look what happened to him. Gaddafi dropped it in 2009. Look what happened to him. Okay? Uh, the, the fellow in Syria, Assad, dropped it in 2006, and there was a, a guerrilla war that we fomented, okay? This is Putin, okay? But there, you're not going into Russia. Hitler tried that, Napoleon tried that, that's over, okay? The Chinese thing is over. Okay, China surpasses the United States in um, as the largest crude importer. And China, I'll move it kind of fast because I know we have time. China um, is a, now their crude oil benchmark is backed by gold. Uh, if you take a look at what's happening to the value of the currencies, I'm going to go kind of fast. The dollar index, notice the dollar has fallen about 20%. Um, notice what's happened with the renminbi, which is the uh, currency, much more stable. Okay, it has become much more stable. All right, I'm going to do it if we say that the petrol yuan supplants the dollar, oil importing nations no longer need dollars, the demand for dollars and treasuries drop, U.S. dollar declines, there will be a dollar crisis, which will be higher inflation, interest rates will increase, and you'll have a debt crisis. Okay, that's exactly what Trump is fighting. Okay, uh, the petrol dollar is the big bet of Russia and China. Um, now, I'll just give you the, the relationship. This is Russia. These are the, um, if you take a look, these are all of the pipelines that are being built to bring what? To bring oil to China and the other uh, countries. Um, this, the Trans-Siberian Pipeline. You see what happens, folks. We think we can put um, sanctions and things. People find a way around them. They find a way around them. Okay, China does have a couple of weaknesses. Okay, one of the weaknesses is they got a lot of bad loans. They um, they uh, got a lot of people in the business. Uh, they have they are going to have a housing crisis because they're overbuilt. The other crisis they have is it is a centrally directed kind of a mercantilist economy. It is not as efficient as ours. Our, if we can just leave our economy alone. Uh, get rid of this cancer called progressivism, which actually started with Teddy Roosevelt. It's been a disaster. It's, it's gotten us into wars. We haven't won a single blasted war. If you take a look at the outcomes, yeah, militarily, yeah, but we lost it uh, politically and economically. And so what's happening is, is we, our weakness is getting involved in this stuff, but our strength is our economy. They have a weakness in their economy. Centrally directed economies are not as efficient. So we should not be afraid of, um, we should not be afraid of, uh, of uh, competing with them. Um, uh, 
if you take a look at what's happening now, uh, and I'm sure some of you are going to ask me, this here, ladies and gentlemen, is a very, very dangerous sign. The yield curve, the difference between short-term and long-term interest rates is flattening. When that does, normally it portends, or, uh, portends a recession. Okay? I told all my students, when that thing reverses, get out. Uh, I got out in 99, I got out in 2007. Okay? This is, oops, well, this is, as I say, this is, this here tightening of this yield curve. This is the difference between short and long term rates. Is, is um, a cause for real concern. If that reverses, get out. Get into cash. Okay? Okay, can we go on the gold standard? You betcha. Okay? Take a look at the United States metric tons of gold. We have more than Russia or China. We could easily go on the gold standard. Um, and I, if I were uh, telling people, don't have a constitutional convention, okay? Just back the dollar with gold and silver. Now, it may have to be a higher rate, but it'll bring a whole bunch of this stuff to an immediate halt, believe me. Okay, the U.S. dollar will, uh, competes in world markets. Uh, it will now have the same status as the WAD. Now, it will make deficit spending more difficult because they're going to have, somebody's going to have to tell my favorite New Yorker, Chucky, that Chucky, you can't print any more money. We don't have the gold to back it. The game is over. Okay? And it's going to pretend about a 20% cut in the budget. Born gold, uh, now all of you are going to benefit. But the, the federal government's going to take the hit because they're going to have to cut that budget about 20%. Because they can't print the money anymore. That's over. Okay? Okay, long-term impact, changes the money supply, affect prices, monetizing the debt, that's what we've been doing, means creating extra money to offset deficit spending in order to prevent interest rates. Okay, I'm going I'm to move a little quickly because um, if you can take a look at what's happened um, since um, we've gone off the gold standard, now take a look at the, um, the end of Bretton Woods right here, okay? This is what? The national debt. Okay, the amount of money printed and the price of CPI. Okay, it's connected. What happened? We love gold, national debt has soared, consumer debt has soared, student debt has soared. All right, consumer price index has soared. We've been printing money like crazy. Um, I told my students, I said, you know what, I know this is not going to go over well with some of you, but you know what the Iraq war cost us? Six trillion. Okay, you know what six trillion is? It's four times the amount of student loans. We could have paid off the student loans four times. And what, I don't know what we got out of that. Okay, I think they want me to kind of end now. I was going to talk about regulations, but I know that you're probably going to have questions. Um, and I'll be glad to take any of the questions that you have. Um, and I'll leave my, I can download the PowerPoint so you can send it out to people. Okay, does someone else do the questions or? I, I know that some of this stuff is probably, uh, old hat to some of you in, in the conservative movement. Okay. How does the um, increase in U.S. oil production affect the situation? It'll tend to bring oil prices down because the United States will no longer be buying oil on world markets, which means that as we produce more oil, remember the economic law, whenever, any place you increase supply, you lower prices every place. So it will tend to be a, have a moderating effect on the oil prices, it will tend to bring oil prices down. However, it has to be above about 60 bucks a barrel to make it cost effective. Okay? Aren't there historical tensions between Russia and China? Absolutely, but we ended those with the sanctions. They're now getting along, okay? There's, nobody becomes buddies except has a common enemy, okay? And that's what we did. We drove them together, which was a, a mistake. So we overcame the natural tensions. Could this derail the one belt? No, it's not going to. The track goes through Russia. They're putting the track through Russia. Why? Because of this crazy idea that these neoconservatives have had. These neoconservatives, folks, 
are the heirs of the progressive movement. They were in the Democratic Party, they've now moved into our party. And it's a crazy idea of sanctions. It's not going to work. Okay. What does all this mean for our relationship with the Republic of Taiwan? How does Taiwan um, uh, figure into this uh, Taiwan uh, Travel Act, how many just passed? Um, I think what happens is, is China doesn't really want to get into a rumpus over Taiwan. They expect at some point, maybe 100 years from now, uh, for it to be like Hong Kong, to become part of a separate uh, entity. But they're very patient. They're not anxious to, from what I talk to the Chinese, not anxious to do that. Um, nor are they anxious, they are not anxious to upset the apple cart in any way. I mean, things are, are going good. How does U.S. locate affect the situation? I guess I've, I've gotten all the answers. Any other questions? We've got a few more questions here, but I think what I'm going to do is give them to you and um, maybe even write brief synopsis that we put in the newsletter and we'll send all the information out to you because we're just running time. Okay. And, and